You're now in the studio with BTFU. Right, it's Glenn, and welcome back to BTFU. And um, we've got a very special guest today, a very multi-talented young man. Um, he's brimming with natural talent in the saddle, and he can sing as well. Uh, he comes from Ireland, from Kildare. He's a two-time champion apprentice here in Sydney since he's been here. And he's recently, last year, become a father. He's won two Group 1 races um, in Sydney. He's had some illness issues himself. And he's on the trail back to becoming a regular back on owners and trainers, regular call lists in the, in the metro area in Sydney. Um, he's, he entered himself onto The Voice and got through to the, the semi-finals. Um, and he's with us here today. Welcome to Robbie Dolan. Welcome, Rob. Thanks for having me. Well, Robbie, it's great to have you here. Um, gee, it's, it's a lot to talk about, um, all, your, all the stuff that you've achieved in the short period of time that you've been in Oz. When, when did you first get here? Came here in September 2016. Uh, initially came over to, to Melbourne, and I probably stayed in Melbourne, I'd say, for about a month, and then I made the switch up to Sydney. Why was that? They wouldn't, they wouldn't give you a crack? Well, I wanted to be an apprentice, and I came over and... and Look, there's a bit of a waiting list down there in Melbourne to get into the apprentice school. And uh, they basically just, they said, no, nah, you're not, you're, you can't just come in and, and, and get into the school. And, and I was with John Sadler and I remember him bringing me up there and he was trying to convince them to to let me in the system and they were having none of it myself. And Louise Day and Ellen Hennessy were all in, all there together. And... Uh, Let's Did you all come out together, all three of you from I Ireland? came out. Louise was here a bit longer than me and Ellen, but me and Ellen flew out on the same flight together. Oh, right. And um, we, we both worked with John Sadler, and I think Louise was with Kieran Marr. And uh, I remember John Sads bringing, him up, bring us, uh, bringing us up there to the, the, the Melbourne, Melbourne Racing uh, headquarters, and let's just say there was a couple of swears on, in the car park on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> So then you decided to relocate to Sydney, yeah, and you were greeted with open arms and and well, I shouldn't say the rest is history, but you've had a you've had a great um, few years in Sydney, two time multiple and well multiple champion apprentice, and I think only one or two people have done that before. So that's to come from overseas and do it is a is a is a big thing, um, but I suppose you're always destined to be a jockey, weren't you? Your parents both rode. Yeah, my mother used to ride when she was young, and then obviously my dad was a jockey, and yeah. grandfather was a multiple group one winning jockey. He as won well. a couple of Irish classics, didn't he? You he won it? a couple of classics back yeah. in the sixties. Um, so you've matched him now. You've won two group ones. Yeah, we yeah. matched. So, um, so like bragging rights are about even. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 hopefully I can get another one before <laughs> I retire. <laughs> oh, there's no doubt about that. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I, I've definitely probably exceeded my expectations coming over. Well, your expectations aren't limited to just two group ones. You're going to obviously, well, I'm tipping you're probably going to have some more. Um, those two group ones you did have, Profondo and um, Shelby66, who's created his own sort of fan club. Um, tell us about those two rides, because Profondo was obviously, I think, a more talented horse who hasn't, hasn't, hasn't really gone on to, to show his, his true potential. But Shelby 66 punched above his weight. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I think so. I think, look, Profondo, I don't care what anyone says. He's the best horse I ever sat on. Like, some of the stuff he used to do, track work at home, is just unbelievable. And it's just it's just goes to show, like, horses are animals at the end of the day. And, and he obviously had his had his traits and, and characteristics that were just hard to you know, deal with sometimes. He used to sort of hang around, hang hang around the place, he used to get keen. Um, but that's just horses, you know, and, and, and um, like the old saying says, if horses knew their own strength, we wouldn't be able to ride them. But you know what, funny you say that. The really good horses, horses that are at the elite level, don't often do many things wrong. He did a lot of things wrong and still won. Yeah. Um, it, I, I think he just was like a rough diamond. He hadn't had any... And he polishing really at that stage because he won a, a group one. What is his third or fourth start? Yeah, his third start. Like, you know, he was just he was just a hard horse to to to, to deal with, and that, you know, that's that's just racing sometimes. Yeah. Um, Richie done a great job to get him to win a group one at his third start because, like, um, you know, I, I was very grateful to be on him that day because when I rode him his second start, he arguably should have won that as well. I pulled a stick on him and he and, and he, he ran swerved, away from yeah. the stick like 
like a flash. Nearly fell off him, nearly trying to steer him. And then his third start, he just put about 70% of it right. And it was good enough to win a group one by about six lengths. Yeah, so he was very, very good. Pretty the impressive. horse that beat him the start before, you you penalled him the next start, didn't he? One of Wallers. Yeah, one of Wallers. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what his name was, but yeah, put penalties on it. Yeah, he was yeah. very impressive that day. Yeah. So so that was... So you've won two apprentice titles, and then you won the group ones as a jock. Mm. What was it like, the transition from a, an apprentice to a jockey? You, you've been quoted as saying it was... You felt very, very alone in that, in that, in that time. Why was that? Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I, you know, I say that to the... To the boys, like you know, like Dylan and Zach, they're coming out of time, and Tyler soon. The one thing that I miss about, um, you know, being an apprentice is the whole camaraderie of being around a stable. You know, you, you you're hanging out with all the stable staff every day. You're you know, you get to really know the horses every morning. Um, and it's kind of like you're just out there fending for your own, and you got to go out in the middle, and and you know, you're riding work for all these different trainers, and. Uh, you know, it's the bit of banter I think uh, in the stable and stuff is is very hard to emulate when you're sort of out there by yourself, and uh, that was one thing I definitely found a little bit hard. Um, but I think you know, if you're if you're just tough enough and you just keep the head down, you know, you'll be fine. It, uh, look, expectations. I mean, when you say you're tough enough, I mean, it's, it's it's a big expectation to expect a young kid. I mean, I suppose really the the system is is designed for local. Australian children that be come into the system and then, and then grow through it but you've come from overseas so it's you've got no family to fall back on outside of a phone call did you have people that you, you could lean on and talk to or was it basically well fuck what do I do now I'm on my own what, do you, what did you do yeah, racing's, racing is a funny game like it's an individual sport obviously you're by yourself as a jockey out there but um, you got so many other jockeys to look up to and ask advice like yourself and Tommy Berry and um, you know Yui and Karen McAvoy you know it's you just go up to them and say what did I do wrong here and how can I improve on it and it's it's 90% of the time you'll get you'll get a, the right answer a positive response yeah. you know like I don't know what it's like in other individual sports but you know for boxing for example you're you're in a boxing match and you lose if you go up to, you go up to another opponent and say oh what did you wrong there <laughs> they'll the just response. say yeah, yeah yeah you're just bad yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'll beat the shit out of you yeah but it's one thing about asking what you did wrong but if you actually need someone to talk to and all that sort of stuff cuz that's a big thing in 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 any sport nowadays is is your, your mental side and your approach to everything and and it's something that sort of skipped me when I was riding but I can see it coming through and like you've mentioning it to the to some of the young kids and you're, you've now got an old head on still young shoulders that you're giving advice to people that haven't found the troubles that you you may have found is that right? yeah I, I agree with you 100% I think you know obviously the mental side of the game is is something that people don't realise I, I don't think you know the average punter at home will just think geez you give that a bad ride but and they, they, could, be, you on, they yeah, could be going through a lot of stuff other yeah. than just racing you know and, you know, it's, it's a, I reckon it's a bit unfair and it's just the way life is. I mean, you can't you can't sugarcoat it. As, as a as a young jockey, you're in a man's world. You're supposed to be able to do your job and take all the criticism that comes with it. It's fuck. It's a hard thing to do, isn't it? It's a hard job. Yeah. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, not everyone does it. Not everyone does it well. Um, but in contrast to that, when you when you sang on the Voice, and you got obviously very very deep into that competition, and they give you coaches. To help you sing, is there a, is there any sort of is there any sort of thing that you might want to draw out of that and, and and is that why you're trying to give these these uh, like Zach and Dylan some uh, some advice? Did, did you pull some some sort of inspiration from that? Not really, I don't think. I think for me personally, when I went on the Voice, it was so new. Like obviously, I'd done a couple of like school plays and stuff when I was a kid, and and you know little singing competitions went back in like over 10 years ago and since then I've just done like bits of singing at home but when I went in there it was sort of just like this is so cool you know I'm just here like this is how, how am I even here and everyone else is like um, you know like sweating and getting all nervous and I'm just like this is unreal and you were pretty cool with the whole thing I was just you? so like so chill I was so happy to be there and I didn't really know to be honest when I eventually got like 
booted out. It was only like five minutes after that where I was just like, oh shit. Now I'm kind of like <laughs> a bit sad. <laughs> you know, I, was, I wasn't really worried about getting kicked out because I didn't really care. I was happy to get that far. But so once I got kicked out, I was like, kind of kind of enjoyed that, you know. I think it's unfair to say you got kicked out. Booted me out, grabbed me by the head. <laughs> and threw you out. Kicked me out the door, slammed the door behind me. But so so you had a, you had a bit of a sabbatical because that was the period of time you had a lot going on in your life at that point. You got sick yourself. Uh, you'd won a couple of Group One races. You'd qualified as a jock. You had a child that was born 15 weeks prem with you and your partner. Um, so you had a lot to deal with at that point. And then your singing came along and gave you. I suppose it gave you a bit of a lift. But more importantly, I think from the racing perspective, and this is maybe a general opinion. People thought that's where you're going to transition towards, and like you're an extremely talented young rider. You ride light. You've ridden extremely well f- for the time you've been here. I think it's an important message to put out that you actually completely focus back on your riding again, and that's what you want to do. Yeah, hundred percent. I look obviously, you know, a lot of trainers that maybe used to support me um, probably jumped off me just thinking that I'm not fully focused on racing and uh, my mind is, you know, maybe with singing or whatever, but. Um, like last season was my best season and like since since I come out of my apprenticeship winners wise and, and percentage wise and I'm, I'm really hoping now next season like this season just starting that I can really focus on my riding a lot more um, been sort of going in and riding a lot more work recently and um, hopefully you know we'll get back into it and just sort of Try and try and start swimming again in the, in the what a, what's a in the shark pretty infested, deep in the shark Sydney waters. room, yeah. Because because it's really hard even when you even when you are f- like fully focused and and committed to your riding. If you, if you got multiple horses you've been winning on and you jump off one to ride another one, try, like it's an unforgiving business. You you see you, you get sort of harshly treated because of that. And I suppose now being fully committed back to the riding, I'm sure you're going to climb and climb and climb this season, but. In the time that you were away, when I say you away, you were, you were sort of focused on your singing, did you see many changes in racing when you came back? Because you'd, you'd taken a step back. Could you, did you look at it any differently? I, I definitely did, yeah. I, I think sort of, like, you will know yourself, like, I, I felt like I've been apprentice for a million years. You know, I obviously I'd done, like, i come out of the apprentice school in Ireland where I, where I learned how to ride in 2012, and I didn't. Um, you know, I basically didn't get my apprenticeship until like 2015. So that's like three years of just being an apprentice without being an apprentice. Mm. Just doing all the work. Just doing all the work without getting any like racing money. And then obviously you've done two years apprenticeship or only 12 months actually in Ireland. Um, and then, you know, a couple of winners and then moving to Sydney, it's like basically starting again. So then I've done like probably like f- another three three years probably as an apprentice so I've basically apprenticed for like six or seven years yeah um and that's like you know working uh you know seven days a week maybe one day off every two weeks and going racing and so what sort of when I got got injured that time and, and stepped away with this and done the singing for 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 a while and then we had Maisie and um it definitely it it, it to be honest it probably made me more lazy than anything I, I sort of stepped away and I was just like it's just so easy to be forgotten about and just yeah. in the shadows and uh, it's kind of hard to get back into it I think you get forgotten about quick in this game you do if you're yeah. out of sight you're out of mind and that's, and that's such a you know such a big saying and, and uh, Maisie's healthy now everything's good she's what a year and a, year and a bit yeah she's a year and probably three months yeah and she's um, yeah she's pretty tough now She's she's got a you know, a couple of little things here and there that they're just checking out, but it's really like it's nothing too serious compared to what it could have been. Yeah, that's right. So, the Voice Australia was good for you. You sang on Cox Plate Day. That must have been great. Yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah. It was hilarious. To Did be you honest. ride on the day as well? I didn't ride on the day. No. Um, it was it was pretty hilarious to be honest. When they, you know, and obviously when they asked us to do it and stepping into the shoes of Daryl Braithwaite, which has been a, such a success for the last few years and. Do you sing with him? Nah, he, he, he was I think he was supposed to do it with us initially and something happened and we ended up just doing it ourselves, me and the band. And uh it was funny, like everyone was all the comments were like online were saying, Oh he lip he was lip syncing. So I, and I was like 
pissing myself laughing like I don't even know how to sing how can I lip sync like you know what I mean I've only been doing this for a few months I'm not good enough to be fucking lip syncing so it doesn't matter what you do you, whoever oh, someone's going to criticize that's you that's probably another thing yeah, you, yeah. you get criticism whatever you yeah. do but it was pretty positive the whole you know I think the t- it was the TV I think um, it was sort of the sound wasn't matching the vision it was like three seconds behind on the vision compared to the sound and everyone's like oh he's lip syncing so anytime we actually sing that song live um, the horses yeah. I always say um, um, when we sang this live on the Cox Play they told us we were lip syncing and then we sing it and then, and then at the end I'm like told you I wasn't fucking lip syncing there you go there you go so you, you mentioned about your, your own you got your own injuries you got brachial neuritis is that right yeah tell us yeah. what that is so it's like a nerve defect sort of slash injury from excessive use they reckon but it's a very unknown sort of thing. It's it's. Was it your right hand? It was my right hand. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. from that. So it was actually both hand, both arms. Um, I, uh, me and Christine were away on holidays up in Queensland, and I remember waking up one morning. I just had this pain in my arm, and it sort of started actually at the races at Newcastle. From now that now that I think of it, I just got that same pain, and then it went away for a few days, and then we went on holidays, and I just woke up and I had this just pain, and then went to brush my teeth in the bathroom and went to reach out to grab the to, um, sort of toothbrush and I just got pins and needles the whole way up my arm. So I thought I was having a stroke. So I rang um, uh, rang the doc, Dr. Duckworth, and he said, um, come in and see me, uh, you know, as soon as you can. And I'm like, I'm away on holidays until like two days' time. So I had to just sort of put up with monitor it, it for a yeah. couple of days. I went to see him and... He didn't really know, so he sent me to a nerve specialist. Then I went to the hospital, and they didn't know what it was. And they ruled out, like, a heart attack and a stroke, and then they done all the muscle muscle tests and, and nerve tests, and it wasn't a trapped nerve, and then eventually they they narrowed it down to this brachial neuritis. So, it's, so how uh, do you fix it? Uh, I basically stayed in the hospital for, like, two weeks, and every single morning at about 6 a.m., they would hook me up to, a like, a steroid drip, and... Uh, basically I think it's supposed to like just f- flush out your whatever you have and to be honest I didn't really know what what the hell was going on because it was so much like experiments had to get a couple of lumbar punctures which were horrible and was in there for a good you know a week and a half two weeks nearly and then mm. it was pretty rough it was pretty it was it wasn't it really was nice I never felt like myself at all you know you're on all the drugs that try and sort you out and, um, and then after that sort of I went back to the hospital once a month for another sort of flush. Go in at 6 a.m. in the morning. You'd be finished by like 5 p.m. just all day. You're just sitting on a drip, with a drip in your arm in the bed. So I done that for like six or seven months, and then eventually. Wow. And you were riding in between stopped. that. I I wasn't riding. No. No, I I was riding. Um. Sort of after about three months. Mm. So I had like a three month period where I was going in once a month, and getting the the flushes done. Um, whilst I was riding, but I wasn't I I I wasn't riding for a couple of months because of that. So I didn't know if I was gonna end up back riding because I couldn't straighten my left arm, and then my right arm was doing it as well. And yeah, but it's it's they no, they normally get it from a flu sh- like from a flu shot. It's like a side effect of a flu shot. Oh, yeah. Like it's it's probably one in like Not five the COVID million. Shot. It's like one in five million to get it, and me and Josh Parr got it at the same time. Oh, that's right. I remember Josh, you got so it too, yeah. They have a different name for it as well, but brachial neuritis is the, is the name. And it's, it's, all, it's all fixed now. It seems good. Like That's great. I've had bits and bobs of it, like, but it goes away, so it seems, seems pretty solid now. Well, it's great to see you back doing all your riding and all that, um, yeah. getting strong. So those, those steroid drips, they didn't make you put on any weight. Well, still, I was, I'm, pretty, still like a I'm match- pretty big, you know. You still look like a matchstick with the wood shaved off. I'm getting pretty hardy. <laughs> yeah, you've got to run around in the shower to get wet, haven't you? Yeah, I do, actually. Yeah, You're I very lucky. I, I'd lied. I actually put, put a towel over the drain so I don't fall in. <laughs> That's very good. Uh, can you sing us a song? Give us a couple of couple of chords? Probably, yeah. Uh, got to, We'll pay you for it. Yeah, well, I don't sing for free anymore. You should know that. <laughs> well, you've you got a beer. Huh? you got a Guinness. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sing you a little song. What do you want me to? Hear? What do you want to hear? I don't know. You you be the you be the judge of that. Come on, just get. What's your favorite song in the whole world? Mine. Uh, you sing Queen. Yeah. Sing. Give us a Frank uh, Freddie song. She gets some more than shining in a pretty cabinet. Let them stay, she said. Just like Mary Antoinette, building a remedy. 
Khrushchev and Kennedy. No, not the rest. Look at that, and the, and, the, and, the, and the foot goes, and it's just perfect. That's great. That was really good. Thanks, Rob. No, Freddie Mercury, I tell you. <laughs> oh, I tell you, it's been great, though. Um, you're full of talent. You're full of uh, enthusiasm. I can see you've got your love for racing back. Um, it's great to see you back on the track, and um, I'm sure that phone's going to be ringing nonstop. Um, anyway, that's, that's uh, our guest today, Robbie. And um, if you haven't liked or subscribed, please do so and share whatever you, whatever you can.